For hundreds of years we have sought to generate free, costless or inexhaustible energy with inventions such as perpetual mobiles following this objective. However none of them has proven to be functional because the energy cannot be generated from nothing. It must come from or be transformed from some other source. This source of energy can be present in the environment in different forms, such as water, earth, fire, air. Although unfortunately these sources can disappear when we need them the most, because we are not able to control them at our will. Luckily, energy can also be stored in materials or objects, as can be fuels, chemical cells found in batteries or even in mechanical systems, the latter option being much more versatile because they can generate energy virtually independent of the place where they are located. Although, of course, its versatility has a cost, the duration. In low consumption and low use devices it is possible to achieve an autonomy of months or even a few years. But for larger devices such as an electric car, it is unthinkable to assume that the battery will last for months of continuous use. But on Voyager 1, which is billions of kilometers away from planet Earth, even after more than 40 years, a generator continues to provide the energy necessary for it to operate. What's more, according to NASA itself, to this day, none of these generators, also used on other missions, have ever stopped producing electricity. And that is why in this video we will talk about Voyager's almost infinite power, or more specifically, how a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, also known as nuclear batteries. Let's start with a bit of context before getting into the technical part. Although the Voyager probes are not the only ones that use this type of generators, Voyager 1 is currently the farthest man-made object from planet Earth. So I thought it was a good opportunity to talk about them. The Voyager 1 and 2 space probes were launched in 1977 with the main goal of exploring Jupiter and Saturn along with other planets of the solar system. The mission was initially projected to last five years, but to this day both probes continue to send data from beyond the aliopause, which they crossed in 2012, and which corresponds to the theoretical limit where the influence of the solar system ends and interstellar space begins. At the time of this animation, the Voyager 1 probe is 22 billion kilometers from planet Earth, a distance so unimaginably great that the signal sent, which travel at the speed of light, take more than 20 hours to reach the Earth. To give you a point of reference, sunlight takes on average about 8 minutes and 20 seconds to reach the Earth. In other words, the Voyager 1 probe is located 149 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, a unit known as an astronomical unit. At such a great distance from the Sun, the amount of light the probes receive is so small that it would be impossible to generate the energy needed to operate them using photovoltaic panels. And at the same time, due to the long mission duration, the use of fuels or chemical cells was not feasible either. Because of these limitations imposed by the context of use, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator was the only viable option to keep the probes running. The operation of this type of generator can be separated into two parts as its name indicates. On the one hand the use of a radioisotope, and on the other hand the generation of electricity through thermoelectric effects. To understand what a radioisotope is, we must first understand how the elements are composed. In an extremely simplified way, we can say that an atom has three different types of particles, protons, neutrons and electrons, the number of protons being that determines which element it is exactly. In fact, if we look at the periodic table we will notice that in one of the corners there is a series of numbers that follow an order. This is known as the atomic number and corresponds precisely to the number of protons in the element. In other words, if the number of protons changes, the element changes. However, both the number of electrons and neutrons in an atom can change without it becoming a different element. Considering this, 
The isotopes of an element simply correspond to a series of atoms with the same number of protons, but with different numbers of neutrons. But that's not all, we can also categorize isotopes on the basis of two criteria. First, whether they are naturally or artificially produced. And second, whether the isotopes are stable or unstable. The latter category is the one that interests us, since an unstable isotope is what is known as a radioisotope or radioactive isotope. This particular type of isotope, as its name implies, is incapable of maintaining its composition, because it possesses an excess of nuclear energy. The way for it to become stable again is to eliminate the excess energy, which is done through the emission of different types of highly energetic particles, a process that is also known as radioactive decay or radioactive disintegration. When this process occurs, there are two possible outcomes. The unstable isotope can become a stable isotope, or it can become another unstable isotope, continuing the cycle until it becomes a stable isotope. Given this behavior, no unstable isotope will emit radiation indefinitely, although, of course, the rate of radioactive decay can vary greatly from one isotope to another. The most common way to measure the speed of decay is by calculating the median life or half-life of the particles, which corresponds to the required time for half the nuclei of an initial sample of radioisotopes to decay. That is, if at zero time we have 100% of the nuclei without disintegration, when this period passes, there will be 50%, then 25%, then 12.5%, and so on. For isotopes such as oxygen-15, where 15 represents the sum of neutrons and protons of the atom, this period is just 122 seconds. For carbon-14, 5.700 years, and for uranium-235, some not at all insignificant 700 million years. But now back to the main topic, of all the existing radioactive isotopes. One of the most used in thermoelectric generators is plutonium-238 with a half-life of 87 years. But even more important than that, this particular isotope is used because it disintegrates emitting alpha particles, which have a high mass and therefore interact with other atoms, being easily stopped on collision with them, which in practical terms means that if we have a piece of plutonium-238, the kinetic energy of the alpha particles will be converted into heat upon collision, either with itself or with other surrounding elements, generating 0.568 watts per second in the form of heat per gram of this element, all this completely spontaneously, without the need to provide an initial energy, a chemical reagent, or anything like that. Understanding this, if we analyze a radioisotope thermoelectric generator from the inside, its heart is a series of elements known as GPHS or General Purpose Heat Source, which, in the particular case of the Voyager probes, consists of a cylindrical container with a series of iridium spheres, a metal of high hardness, high density, high resistance to corrosion and a melting point of over 2000 degrees Celsius. That is, a perfect material to contain plutonium-238. This general-purpose heat source is then covered by a series of thermocouples, which, as we saw in the previous video on thermoelectric effects, are elements that, thanks to the Seebeck effect, are able to generate a voltage when there is a temperature difference between their two junctions. And because the temperatures in space are extremely low, differences of up to 700 degrees Celsius can be generated between the inside and outside of the generator. Finally, the thermocouples are covered by a final layer, which serves both a structural purpose and the purpose of dissipating the heat generated inside. The Voyager probes have three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, each with a mass of 37 kilograms, of which 4.5 kilograms were plutonium-238 at launch, and which together were capable of generating a power of 470 watts. Now, after taking a thousand turns, we can finally talk about why I said that these generators produce almost infinite power. Remember the half-life of plutonium-238? It took 87 years for only half of it to disintegrate, that is, 87 years after its launch, theoretically, the system will still be able to generate about 235 watts. 
in 175 years, 117 watts, and so on, which is much more than we could ask of any other type of battery. Although, of course, there are other factors that make the reality very different from the theory. For example in the case of thermocouples, although they do not fail easily since they do not have moving parts, their efficiency will be affected after years of use. Furthermore, even if they continue to generate energy, this does not mean that it is enough to power all the probe systems. In fact, if you go to the NASA website you will see that most of Voyager's instruments are turned off, which is probably one of the reasons why it is still able to function even after 40 years, by which time the generators should be generating about 70% of their original power. Now, to give you a more recent example, the Perseverance rover will be powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. If you pay attention to its design, this structure at the rear of the rover will probably look quite familiar to you. Its internal structure and the power generated is different from that of the Voyager probes, but the principle of operation is exactly the same, and this technology will probably continue to be used for many years to come. If you like this video remember to subscribe, and if you think that what I do is worth it, you can also support me on Patreon to make more and better videos, in addition to getting access to the 3D models that I use in my animations and your names in the credits. That's all for now and I'll see you in the next video.